Yo, what is going on everybody? Dan Drifty here and welcome back to my tutorial series, Browser Noise. This is tutorial number three and today we are going to create a few more DOM elements so that we have a fully functional noise generator. Currently we have, I guess like a knockoff cheap noise generator. All, all it is is you can turn it on and off. So we want something a little more than that. So let's get started. Let's go ahead and declare two variables. One will be called choose noise and the other one will be called set volume. Then down in the setup function, we will go ahead and set choose noise equal to uh, a, a select menu. So in order to do that, we'll say create select, open close parentheses, and then we'll set, we'll set set volume equal to a slider and let's see what we get when we run that we have a little select menu uh, which is empty now and we have a slider that we can interact with let's go ahead and position these directly to the right of our buttons and so to do that we'll say position at 60 10 and then set volume dot position at 130, 10, and let's see what that looks like. Boom, okay. Now let's add some options to our select menu and we'll do that by saying choose noise dot option. And then this is where we'll type in the different types of noise. So let's copy that three times and Call this one pink and this one brown. And let's go ahead and also get rid of our brown noise when we first initialize Mr. Noisy. Now, when we press run, we have three options. Okay, now is the fun part. Fun part. We're going to add event listeners to our brand new DOM elements. Um, but before we do that, I want us to take a second to just think about how we interact with these new DOM elements and how it differs than our buttons. Our buttons are kind of simple. It's just listening for when the mouse is pressed. And once the mouse is pressed, then you can fire the, the function and we can set the command noisy dot, Mr. Noisy dot start or whatever. With our drop down menu, it's a little bit different because first you click and then that just opens up the options. And then you click again to choose the option. And that's two clicks. And yeah, you're probably thinking you can use mouse press and then just filter out one of the mouse press. But, but there's actually a nice uh, event listener that we can call called change. So it's going to fire the, the function when the option has changed. So we need to define that function and we'll do it as we've done before. And we are going to call choose noise dot value to get the value of that changed option. So um, this isn't going to work. Let's just console dot log what happens uh, when you uh, do this. So we'll hit run and then I'll press pink and you can see in our console we have the word pink, it outputs a string, and we can use these strings to pass into the Mr. Noisy.set type method, right? So now let's go ahead and say Mr. Noisy.set type, and then inside that we'll go ahead and set, say choose noise.value. And then we don't need our print anymore, so let's get rid of that, and let's go ahead and hit run. And now when I press play, it's white noise, drop down, hit pink, change the noise generator to pink, and then brown, boom. Now we can stop, everything is excellent. Let's talk about that slider. The event listener that we want to attach to it is, again, not going to be mouse press, because while there is a mouse press involved in our interaction with it, there's also mouse dragging and mouse releasing, uh, so it's not going to work for us. We could do what we did with the uh, drop-down menu and add a changed event listener, but the problem with that is while you're dragging, it doesn't output anything. It only outputs when you release 
the the mouse. The listener we're going to want to add is going to be called input. Now let's define our function as we have before. And let's see what values are logged when we call set volume dot value. I'm going to hit run. And then let me pull up console a bit just so you can see. It's going to spit out values between 0 and 100. OK, that's great. But the problem is we want to pass the values from the slider into Mr. Noisy dot amp. And these values are way too big. We only want to pass in values between zero and one because that's what our amplitude method on our noise generator is sort of expecting. So we can, of course, scale those values, but a better way to do that is probably to just pass in arguments when we first initialize our slider. So the first two arguments are going to be the range. So we're going to want an output between zero and one. So I'm going to pass in a zero and a one. The third one is going to be a initial initial state of the knob. So when I first run it, it'll be all it'll be set all the way to zero. And then the fourth argument is going to be a step size. So um, this should be something. You know, let me just show you what 0 0.25 looks like when I run it. It's going to snap to the nearest quarter, if that makes sense. So there's only really five settings, five volume settings on the slider. Uh, we want something a little bit smoother. So we'll just go ahead and enter a zero and now we'll hit run. And as you'll see, we have a smooth slider. Fabulous. We're almost there. Let's go ahead and initialize Mr. Noisy amp to zero because that's what our slider is initialized to. And then we're going to pass set volume dot value into Mr. Noisy dot amp. And then we're going to get rid of our console dot log and let's run that real quick. And as you'll see, we can adjust the slider, press play. Press stop. That was a little loud for me. Um, then you can change it to brown. Press play. Adjust the slider. Awesome. One thing I want to add real quick is just a secondary argument of a 0 0.1 or just some small value. 0 0.01 will work into our Mr. Noisy dot amp because whenever we're adjusting the amplitude dynamically, we're going to want to add what's called a slew time. And what this is going to do is it's going to ramp my relatively slow input events at the sample rate over the course of whatever amount of time we put here. So in this case, it's 0.01 seconds. And this is going to make for a smooth sounding slider. Okay, everything works as desired. When I hit play, we have brown noise. We can adjust the volume. We can adjust the type. Awesome. Here's the thing. I kind of want to consolidate our two buttons into a single button. It's a really common user interface design to do such a thing. If you think about it, all the devices you have at home, you have a button that toggles the state to on. And then when you hit the same button, it toggles that the state to off. So we can do that. Let's go for it. First, let's comment out our current buttons and then go to our list of declarations and add another one called toggle on off. Then in our setup function, we'll set toggle on off equal to create button with a string of on slash off to display. Then we'll position it by saying to toggle on off dot position and we'll put it at 10 pixels in, 10 pixels from the top. Then toggle on off dot mouse pressed is going to be our event listener and we'll define a function in here. Thus far, when we've defined our functions, it's typically been like one line of code. Turn something on or change the value of something to whatever the value of the slider is, whatever. In our case, when we hit the button, we want to first check the state of Mr. Noisy. If Mr. Noisy is on, then turn it off. Otherwise, if it's off, turn it on. We're going to do that with an if statement, and that's going to take on the following form. 
if, open and close parentheses, open and close curly braces, else, open and close curly braces. The way this is going to work is we're going to put a condition inside our parentheses, and that condition evaluates to either true or false. If it evaluates to true, then whatever code is inside these curly braces is going to fire. Otherwise, if it evaluates to false, whatever code in these curly braces is going to fire. So in our case, when we first initialize Mr. Noisy, it automatically generates a local Boolean variable called started. And this is going to evaluate to true if Mr. Noisy indeed has been started. Uh, and if it has not been started or if it's ever been stopped, it's going to evaluate to false. So we can read this entire line as if Mr. Noisy has started, then Mr. Noisy dot stop. Otherwise, Mr. Noisy dot start. And as you will see, when we hit run, we now have a single button. And when I give it a little volume and hit it, it works. It toggles on and off every time I hit it. Fab. I kind of want to now dynamically adjust what is displayed on our button so that when it is in the off state, it says play so as to tempt the user to press it so that the noise plays and then vice versa. When we turn it on, we want to prompt the user with the word stop so that they know when they hit that button, it stops the noise. All right, I'm going to hit shift tab to reformat all of my code. And now you'll see that the if statement is separated into different lines, which is a much more common format. So let's add some semicolons there. And then below Mr. Noisy, we will say toggle on off and we'll set what is displayed by calling the HTML method and we'll pass in the string play because we will have just stopped Mr. Noisy in this condition case, right? Copy that and paste it right below Mr. Noisy.start. And let's go ahead and change the string to stop because that's what we want it to display after we've started the noise. And since Mr. Noisy begins in the off state, let's go ahead and pass in the string play when we initialize the button. Now hit run and watch this. Give it a little, little volume, a little brown noise hit play, it toggles to stop, hit stop, it toggles to play, amazing. Before we go, let's talk a little bit about style. Our buttons and drop-down menus, they're not particularly attractive, we'll just say. It, they've got that like default aesthetic, right? Like if we were going for an aesthetic, we've truly nailed the default aesthetic. So I do want to quickly show that you can adjust the style right here by calling the style method on your DOM elements. You're going to pass in two strings. The first one will be the property like font family. And then the other one will be the value. And then when you hit run, you can see we've just changed the font of our play button. And I'll go ahead and add that to our drop down menu as well. So you can see that looks like that. And now it's starting to look more customized and personal. And if you know any CSS, you can actually go ahead and hit that little arrow button, go to the CSS page and start styling right here. Uh, but that's a little bit outside of the scope of our project for today. All right, last, last thing, I promise. This entire time, we could have been drawing custom buttons, sliders, dials even, uh, right within the P5 canvas. And uh, we'll probably do a little bit of that later, but it was really important for me to begin this tutorial series by getting you used to using DOM elements. One of the most common mistakes that I see when people use lib like sound libraries alongside the, something like P5.js is that they use the draw function or the animate function to handle all of their events um, when DOM elements are far less taxing. DOM elements don't need to be redrawn 60 times per second at the frame rate or whatever. And second of all, you can't, you don't have to be spamming your audio 
objects with parameters that you're constantly setting in the draw function. That's not the greatest style. I wanted you to start using DOM elements, and I think we've gotten uh, really used to DOM elements by this point in the series. So I'll see you in the next one later.